Okay, welcome everybody to Don't Work for Free, which is listed differently on the schedule, but it's basically the same idea. I am Frances Roop, and this is my special guest star, Eric Pohl, who came all the way from, tell them where you came from, Eric. Directly or uh, <laughs> Rothstell, Pennsylvania, by way of Elwood City. Okay. I, I woke up in Elwood, in Elwood City this morning. So, uh, we don't know where you're going to wake up tomorrow, though. Wake up tomorrow. <laughs> I expect to wake up in the same place tomorrow. But there's a lot. There's a lot of. Uh, there's a lot of stuff between here and there. This is podcast, so anything can happen here. It's infinite possibilities. All right. So, first of all, I thought it would be really important to not overlook the irony that we are here telling you that you shouldn't work for free, but we're here for free to impart our two cents on you. <laughs> so, uh, slide master, there we go. All right, so just to give you a little bit of history here. <laughs> Eric and I go way back. We've known each other since we were teenagers. And we have agreed and disagreed, I think, countless times over the years. So this should be really interesting. There's Eric. Uh, I'm, I have no exp explanation for that mustache. There's myself. <laughs> Myself on the right, we have no idea what happened to Pound Park. If anybody knows, maybe see us after the podcast. So it's just so nice to have him here after all these years. But fast forward, let's talk about what I do now. Um, I'm what you call one of your old school journalists. I cut my chops. Uh, this will give away my age, but no secrets here, right? 34. Um, back in the late 80s, editor of college newspapers and working, working the beats around town for the Post Gazette. Um, worked for Pittsburgh City Paper for a long time. I was a columnist for them for at least 15 years which is a really good tenure for someone. A terrific columnist for City Paper, by the way. Well, thank you, thank you. That's very nice of you. <laughs> but being, being paid for all of that. And so now that the journalism industry isn't quite what it used to be, and we're not, gonna, we're not here to blame anyone, <laughs> well, at least not yet. We're going to get to that. Uh, I make a living as a public relations professional for a nonprofit that I believe in. I do a lot of writing for them. I am also, if you can see that slide up there, I am one of 16, apparently there are only 16 social media mavens. I, I would say that I'm more of a grand dame at this point in my life. <laughs> so I'm out there trying to keep up with the kids with social media, and the way that I use social media is to kind of, that's really nice you're wearing my sunglasses, by the way, good job. They look better on you than me. The bloggers and I join forces now to raise money for causes that we believe in. Uh, one is a holiday gift project that I work on every year for the nonprofit that I work for. So we come together. So that's a case where blogging for free is okay. Enough about me. Eric, tell them what you do. That's a nice picture. <laughs> we just found that. Um, we're working backwards these days. I, and it's, again, ironic that uh, we're, we're up here because we're getting, we can both get paid to write. Uh, I'm a reporter and columnist for the Elwood City Ledger. And I'm also the author of the upcoming book, Company of Heroes. It's, a, it's about uh, Vietnam War Medal of Honor recipient Leslie Sado. And uh, that's being published by Osprey Publishing. So I've, I've self-published, which means I paid them 
This time, I'm being, this time I'm being mass market publisher, which means they're paying me, which is always preferable. Uh, that picture right there is uh, is a photo of me at uh, Leslie Sabo's Medal of Honor ceremony in 2012. Uh, which room of the White House is that? The Red Room. The Red Room. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so that, uh, that that's uh, my I've, I've dabbled in blogging to little effect. Right now, I use Facebook a lot to. Uh, I, I, I'm learning the uh, the wisdom of George Takei, who said the bat, who, upon reaching eight million followers on Facebook, said that he likes to use humor and uh, and be positive, which I think is a good way to attract a following in any in any venture. Well, look at this following that we have right here now. So it's working. So you just gotta believe, Eric. Well, you didn't print out your talking points, but that's actually okay. did. <laughs> I just got them cleverly hit. Okay, so I think fun. that's enough about us, huh? Yeah. All right, let's move along. So I had to laugh because we'll get to this. The other day, I was just flipping channels, and I happened to come upon Wheel of Fortune. I haven't seen Wheel of Fortune in ages. And you know how they do the introductions of the contestants. And I just happened to catch the last young man. You know, what do you do? Well, I'm a blogger. And I thought, well, that's a very dignified way of saying I'm basically unemployed. But, <laughs> but, but we'll get to that. Now, you used to be you'd say you were a freelance reporter when you were unemployed. But a freelance reporter got paid, though. See, that's the thing. You were getting money, and so and, and you didn't rely strictly on your freelance reporting, not to argue or anything. So, um, one of the reasons that I feel that you should get paid for your work is because it's work, and nothing lends itself to allowing yourself some dignity than to be paid for what you do. So this is an, an analogy. I tossed around a few ideas. But uh, we came up with the, the garage mechanic analogy because we thought that people could relate to that in some way or another. So, I'll start and please interrupt me at any moment. It's, it's quite all right. Um, David's really good at it now. So, you can interrupt me too, by the way. And anybody from the audience, if you have anything you want to say, just raise your hand. Um, so, here's the analogy. A man who thinks he's a really good mechanic, he decides, hey, he's going to approach the local garage owner because he's had this big dream and he just wants to be a mechanic. He's not really concerned about getting paid. He just wants to tinker and he wants to fix your car. And, and we both knew lots of people like this growing up. <laughs> we did. I have better mechanics now. My, my car is 10 years old and doing pretty well. Yeah, we, we, we did know a lot of these people. Um, so the guy's good, but he doesn't have the training and he's not super skilled. And he goes to the garage owner and he says, Sir, Mr. Roop, because didn't your father own a garage? That's, well, that's kind of how we came up with the analogy. Mr. Roop, I would like to work for your garage. I would like to be a mechanic. And you know what? I think I'm good enough, and I'll do it for free. And your dad, in a momentary lapse of reason, because I know that your dad would have never done this, says, okay, sure. Why, you know what? You're good. You're not the best, but you're, you're okay. So we will, I'll hire you. And all the, all the aspiring mechanic wants <clears throat> is for his name to be on the front of the shop. He just wants a little bit of glory. He doesn't want to be paid. He's just happy that he's tinkering around with your car. So then Mr. Roop, your dad, who kind of talks like that, says, well, you know, the guy who's been working for him for 10 years 
I don't need you anymore. <clears throat> I have someone now who will do it for free. So now you have this situation where you have two people who don't receive pay. You have a person who's been displaced from the workforce, the mechanic who's worked there for 10 years, and now you have a man who is going to fix your car for free. So that's two people. So I'm not sure how that's driving the economy. And the question that I would have for anyone would be, would you want this man to fix your car? You guys are a real easy sell. I was expecting a lot of, well, maybe we'll get to that. John, maybe, maybe you have a counter argument down there, but we, we're ready, we're prepared for it. So anyway, what happens is whenever people offer their work for free, they're not able to support their life. They're, they're not able to pay their rent. They're not able to feed their kids. Can we advance to the next slide, please? So there's a homeless person, and I know that's a very uh, visceral image, <clears throat> and and maybe somewhat dramatic. Advance again? Yes. Well, I do. I do get paid somewhat sparsely, and the only difference <laughs> between between me and that is that I married a nurse. So. Well, that was more yeah, because the, the, mar the marketplace does value nurses a lot more than they value content uh, content providers. So, well, and you know, we're going to discuss content. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get the, talking about content. So then we go and we see, you know, this is not your typical person who's face facing a housing crisis. This is a creative director who will write advertising for food. So, would you like to advance to the next slide, please? And this, this is just a little Kirk cartoon. Um, so another, I was hoping that some younger people would be here, but it is Sunday. I mean, it is a Steelers bye week, so you would think that there would be some. Maybe there's some stuff. Well, I would, yeah, this was geared a little bit more toward the younger crowd because I wanted to emphasize to them that, you know, there is a real crisis with student loans happening out there. And so that's another reason why you need to be paid because the young man asks mom, can I live in the basement, you know, because I need to pay off my loans and grandpa beat him to it because grandpa <laughs> is still paying off his student loans. That's huge. Excuse me, sure. I, have, I have a comment. Uh, sure. My son, when he was younger, uh, he had a, a rap group, and they, you know, him and his friends did, did CDs, and they went to uh, Ocean City, Maryland one, one time, and they were blasting their music out, and get, not giving away, but selling the CDs for five bucks a shot, mm -hmm. and his theory was, if they pay five dollars for the CD, they're going to want to know what's on it. It's going to have some kind of value to them because they paid money for it. If they give it away, nobody will listen to it. And what year was this? Um, about? Uh, let's see, about 10 years ago. Okay, and that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I mean, there, there are a lot of exceptions to, you know, there are cases where, you know, maybe you need to do something for free, and we'll get to that, or for a reduced rate, but you're right, because that's something of value. He wasn't, your son wasn't asking a whole lot, but $5 was a commitment, and I know that if I paid $5 for a CD, like I think that's how much the bastard bearded Irishman CD was. <laughs> so that was the last one, like independent CD I bought. No, I, I came up through, I came up through sports writing, and I, w I was just listening to a, a tale of woe the other day from the Florida Panthers hockey franchise, the, the NHL franchise. Where one of their one of their beat writers was saying that the club gave away tickets for years and years and years to get people into the stands so that they'd have bodies there. The new new ownership came along. They stopped that, and now you can. It, and because the the tickets never have value, people people won't come to the games now. It, it's it's ice hockey in Florida, so there's that too. 
but people don't come to the games because the crowds are in the hundreds because now they're making people pay for the tickets instead of giving them away. Right, and you know, that is an excellent segue to my next super duper point that I was gonna make, which is when you set your going rate as free, it's really hard to negotiate up. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, you know, you'll, there was this article and I, I would actually, because you're the one who turned me on to the Tim Kreider situation. This was just re very recently, last year, of the New York Times. I would really prefer if you would kind of give us a little synopsis of that. Well, the, uh, the Tim Kreider article, and I actually pulled, in my talk, I actually had a quote pulled out from it. Uh, basically, it's about, it's about a, uh, right? He's a writer. Yes, he's a writer. <laughs> who uh, was, and who was asked three times in a very short period of time to provide work for free. And he did, he did say yes to one of them because it was for a good cause and the woman who asked him was very great. And she was a social worker. She was, she, she was a social worker. So he was helping. But uh, one of the, uh, my, my favorite quote from that article was was uh, referencing to, and uh, I might be stepping on one of your No, thoughts. I was going to say, I bet you I have the same quote highlighted. This, this is partly a side effect of our information economy in which paying for things is a quaint, discredited old 20th century notion, like calling people after having sex with them. The first time I heard the word content in its current context, I understood that all my artist friends and I, that had support content providers, were essentially extinct. This contemptuous coinage is predicated on the assumption that it's the delivery system that matters, relegating what used to be called art, writing music, film, photography, illustration, to the status of filler, stuff to stick between banner ads. Is that what you yeah. want to well, that, I have had several quotes, but that was definitely one of them. That, that, that makes a lot of good points. Uh, content. I want to try this. Let's see what the next slide. Oh, there's, there's Ariana. So she's the queen of content providing. Ariana Huffington. She is, if any of you have heard the term Freakonomics or read that book, she's the example. I. And this, this analogy is going to be a little crass, but I, I call her a pimp, a content pimp. See, I was thinking, I was thinking the, I was thinking the manager at the company store. I'm, I'm, I'm a former steel worker. Well, you're so much older than me too. I'm a former steel worker <laughs> union officer, so I, so I tend to, uh, I, I tend to frame these things in, in union labor type, type language. And this, this is like the old, the old mine boss who. Uh, who pays you so little and makes you shop at the company store, pays you a mind script, makes you shop at the company store, and your grocery bill is more than you is more than you get paid. Uh, like the old Tennessee. Oh, well, that's, that's a conversation we're gonna have afterwards, <laughs> how, how much groceries are. But that was a much more eloquent and uh, relevant, especially I think to this city, even though we're post-industrial or tech, you know, we still have those roots and we're always going to have them and we're always going to embrace those so that's much better than i was going to say she's a pimp a content pimp but she's not giving any of the hoes a cut of anything <laughs> so you know and then there was the, the big stink uh may hill fowler she made the news very briefly she was 15 minutes in the news because she and then she printed her correspondence with Ariana and then. No, I read that piece because you were for you were for. Yes, to and her lackey, who handled everything quite well, um, and despite the fact that she wasn't just providing opinion, that's that's a whole other area there. But actual reporting. Well, now looking at the, reading her article, I guess she was one of the people who broke the uh, the Obama clinging to guns and religion uh, story. Yes, this, I mean, this is an example of a woman who wanted to be a writer and actually had the skills and was providing them with really unique and very well-crafted content, and she had the nerve to ask to be paid, like the other writers. Of course, you have no idea who this woman is, you know, uh, 
just didn't start a revolution. I think and Tim Kreider from the article that you discussed was saying, you know, he knows that he's not going to start a revolution. We're not going to start a revolution here, but he asked, we're going to try. Kreider, Kreider asked very nicely <laughs> that bloggers should, that, that bloggers or anybody who's asked to work for free should politely decline. Right. To which a, a young woman wrote a direct response to this. And this is where I'll pick it up because she's coming from the new economy. And she's explained, she, she was writing a retort to Tim Kreider and I just love it because first of all, there are so many holes in it. <laughs> I will just point out a few. Um, and she was saying, you know, Tim Kreider, you need to stop complaining. You need to, you know, learn how to work the new economy. You can't make, you need to understand, because Kreider's our age, and this woman who was writing her retort saying that she was just pulling her hair out was prob is probably, I would say, 20, mid-20s, maybe late 20s. And she, she thinks she's going to be one of the ones who uh, can ride exposure to fame and fortune. Right, right, exactly. And she was saying how... You know, well, I've made thousands, and, and to which I say, BS, because I'd like to see your tax return. Because maybe one month you freakily made a few thousand, but I guarantee you. And then she says, Well, Tim Kreider, you just need to know that, you know, you just can't make a living on writing alone. That's the way the new economy is. But guess what? 30 years ago, I knew that because I was freelance writing, I had two kids on each hip, and then you know, another one came along. I was consulting for a media company in New York. So she's not telling me anything new. And for as much as a proletariat that she tries to come off, this woman who wrote the retort, her name's not really important, is to me, she's a scab. She's part of the problem. Well, as you were, as you were, because I did, I did not read that article, but as you were describing it, I was thinking she was sounding like, uh, she, she was sounding like someone who would have said to the uh, to the homestead steel workers killed by the Pinkertons that they need to quit complaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Again, dredging up my old union roots. Exactly. And could we advance the slideshow, and then this is going to take us beautifully. I hope we'll slide into the next next point there. So you know, there's there's Cleveland. If you're familiar with the Seth MacFarlane franchise, you know, it's not PC, but Cleveland's a little down on his luck there, but let's but go to the next slide there, David. There's Ariana Huffington. She plays the voice of the bear. Well, I just wonder, do you think she does that for free, Eric? I'm not, I'm not, it's a rhetorical go, go question. Go on, I'm going to say <laughs> don't, that. don't squirm. It's okay. Well, it's not a hard question. <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. But going back just a little bit to what you were saying, um, you know, one of the things that this retort, retortition, what was that? <laughs> we're just, we're just making up words. It's okay. Well, you know, Shakespeare did too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we can do that. The English language is changing. Like, what's in the word selfie? That's in the dictionary. So we could say ret ret retortition. So she says, you know, hey, Kreider, you just need to stop complaining, and you need to just be smart enough. And that takes me to my next point, which is just really huge and kind of a bit of a digression, but there, it, it doesn't matter who it was, but there was an entrepreneur, I have it in here, and the print is so small, I can't read it, but he was just essentially saying that, you know, he's had great success as a blogger and entrepreneur, because he's worked hard. And he said, and, and I paraphrase this quote, that the minorities aren't working hard enough, and that's why they're not successful. And that takes me to my next point, is that this whole idea that blogging and writing and that the internet has somehow democratized or socialized or given us all a voice, well, that's just wrong. Just any way you slice it, being, and, and I know, you look perplexed, and that's okay, I'm going to explain why. You can interrupt me if you want to. <laughs> but if you look around and you see who's blogging, 
and providing content. I guess you use air quotes, but <clears throat> we'll call them scare quotes. That's really what they are. These are people of privilege. Becoming, being a writer, and, and we've conveniently left out photographers, graphic artists, and other people who have creative talents, um, just because I guess we're just kind of folks. We we're, happen to be writers. We're writers. I tried to get a photographer here today, but he was not able to attend. I take pictures, but I'm not very good at it. But it's, it's a predominantly privileged class of people. Because, and I'm going to put my glasses on for this, because this is just such a great quote that explains it so well and echoes my sentiments that, you know, the internet has not given us all a voice. It's given a voice to the people who already are coming from a point of privilege. I mean, there are, certainly there are exceptions to that. And I, you know, I'm here because I want to try to change things, you know? Do what and, I if can you're, and if you're following the Gamergate uh, controversy, uh, you know that if if any voice that's not already privileged, and yes, I I am I am the poster child of privilege here, but a white white male heterosexual. So uh, and, uh, if if you if uh, Francis occasionally I guess reads me on Facebook, but uh, if you have, if you read me on Facebook, you know what I. And you know what I think of you know what I think of uh, the term politically correct that uh, used to be called common respect until people other than white male heterosexual Christians started demanding it. The uh, what, what, what was <laughs> you know I wasn't paying attention. I was looking for my great quote, which I have here. It's a great quote. Okay, I wasted enough time. Then. So it's all right. I'm not going to pay attention to everything you say, but I'm going to. Nobody does. <laughs> So this is basically what, this is, this is the whole quote, um, and I, I believe this is true. This is what props up the system of internships, low rates and writing for exposure. The middle to upper class parent who can drop $900 for rent money here, or $2,000 for a broker's fee there, or who can simply co-sign a lease. Their budding writers get breathing room that millions of other mothers and fathers couldn't imagine being able to provide. So, I mean, that's probably a whole other issue, so we really can't go go too much into that. But, uh, and, and here's the statistic. This is a story about a man who made his living, fed his family, and paid his mortgage by writing for The Atlantic. And they asked him essentially to do a story for free, and he was like, wait, hold on a minute, this is how I pay my bills. And so, you know, there was a lot of go back and forth bickering between The Atlantic and this, this writer. And uh, let's see, as recently as October of last year, Atlantic Associate Editor David Graham wrote that it was stunning that 93% of front page newspaper stories about that year's election were written by white people, especially considering that issues pertaining to race and ethnicity have been incredibly important to the 2002 election. And of course, when I say that those stories have appeared, I'm talking about people who have provided these things for, for free. So. <laughs> okay. And uh, that, that, is, that is an excellent point you talked about the breathing. That, that if you're that if you're a kid who you know if, if mommy and daddy can sort of support you in the in the manner to which you become accustomed, you can you can spend years, months, or even years trying to build up a following that will that would eventually one day get you paid. Um, my I've got a I've got a note here. Self pro self promotion is, these days self promotion is more important than product. And speaking as speaking as someone who's who man who managed to get a book deal. It's hard to get published if you're not already famous for something. You, you look at who's you look at who's getting the book deals now. Uh, Kim Kardashian, uh, uh, and people people who are already famous. Why did you something. say that name? I didn't. I, and I, I don't I don't mean I don't mean to bash, I don't mean to bash I don't mean to bash her because I actually kind of like her. I, I think she's. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, go on. 
how about advancing the next the next slide? Okay, so here's an example I was going to give you. Um, let's see here. A few years ago, I don't know what that date date is. The Post Gazette opened up this forum called Community Voices, where anyone that had a you know a relatively cohesive idea could pitch. But there were meetings to be had, there were contracts that had to be signed, there was talk of revenue sharing, talk that kind of kept falling on deaf ears. And so there I am, Ms. Mon, that's my Twitter handle, M-S-M-O-N. And I'm providing content, and I guess what makes my situation unique is when I started doing this, I was a published and paid writer, and I was bringing an audience to them, and I was doing that because I really believed in journalism, and this is an example of, you know what, I kind of understand that things are a little bit sluggish for you right now, but I really believe in the power of the press, and I want to help. But after a while, I'm seeing ads on my page, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm doing this. It's, it's time for you to maybe ante up a little bit of money, and didn't happen. So three kids, bills, two kids in college, you know, I faced with a choice. So I, I sent what I believe to be a very gracious letter that said, I just, you know, I hope you understand, I can't continue to work for you unless you're going to give me something. And it's very disappointing for me to say that I wasn't even given a thank you or a response. And I had done it for over a year. Um, that's not to say that everyone at the Post-Gazette is a dud. <laughs> I know we're being taped. I have a lot of friends there. There's a lot of really good people over there. But so far as that, that was just kind of a shame. So if you'd like to advance the slide, please. <laughs> so this is what I would like to impart upon anyone who does anything. Show me the money. <laughs> you should always ask, you know, Last I looked, the Post Gazette was in a 401c3. Do I always get it reversed? 501. They're not a nonprofit. The places that aren't nonprofits, they should pay you. Times when it is appropriate to blog for free, when it's maybe a social justice issue, when it's a hobby, when it's something that you know you want to get together. I know that I have participated in um, LGBTQ awareness blogging days. I mean, that these are things that make sense to me. So, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think those are I think those are all excellent points. Um, about ten years ago, I did some I I wrote and this was punditry stuff just to keep my just to keep my column writing chops sharp because I at the time I wasn't writing I wasn't writing in it. I was working in a newspaper strictly as a reporter and I wasn't writing any columns. Um, and I'm kind of the mythical creature that did ride uh, that did ride some give, giving it away to an extent to some to a little bit of success because I I have my book deal in part because I, I contributed to a speech by, I contributed my self-published book to a speech by Barack Obama for the one Medal of Honor ceremony. And that, that indirectly helped me get my book deal. So I'm, uh, I'm, kind, of the, I'm kind of the exception to the rule. I, I, know, I know that that's not you, that, that exposure usually doesn't help you. And we're, we're already we're already almost 40 minutes into this, and nobody's made a joke about uh, dying of exposure. But, well, why don't we just wait until the timing is a little bit better? Okay. I have because I actually have a like a, 
I really worked on that joke, but I may have like overworked it, so I don't know if it's going to be funny. So, if, how about I'll cross so I my fingers? Kept, I should have kept my mouth shut on that one. <laughs> it's okay. But as, as you mentioned, you're the exception. So I'll tell you about maybe, I guess, local economics and the way that blogging has worked. Um, I had just a very informal get together. It, was it Fatheads on the South Side? Was it Reporter for the Post Gazette? Whatever the blogs of the bloggers of Pittsburgh. There seemed to be a dynasty. Oh, and I was part of that. How exciting! One of the old hats at blogging, and what it included. Well, it's still pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's well. Thanks on behalf of the other bloggers in Pittsburgh. There are a lot of people doing some really great, great things, and it included some people who were doing polit political blogging was there. I think that was predominant. And then of course we had Pit Girl, and we were we were talking about how a lot of these people got into blogging. He was explaining to me, not naming names, but just in a private conversation saying, you know, they started blogging it with the hopes that they would eventually be discovered and then be paid for their work. And, you know, pointed out that I was actually the exception to that, that I was the only one who was actually a paid writer who did the blogging, but that was more like therapy for me. I just did it for fun. It was a parody blog. Or I call it satirical, political satire. I was the anti blog, blog, kind of thing. But, when, and, and when you look back at things, you know, out of all the bloggers who kind of went into this idea like, hey, you know, I couldn't get published before, but now maybe some, the only one who was able to turn a buck over from that is Virginia Montanez from Pit Girl, so far as I know. I mean, if there, there may be some others, but she has a monthly column in Pittsburgh Magazine, and I have an idea about what that pays. It's not, you know, she's got to do other things. That's that's not going to pay for everything. So, but that was just the one exception, really. So times are tough out there. There are blogger and a writer. Times are tough out there. The 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 issue is that there's so much free content out there, and it and it is a. It is a, uh, it, it's a, it's a cultural. It, it could be a cultural crisis. I, uh, I, I, I just uh, recently encountered an interview by um, a man for whom I don't care about. I don't care much for <laughs> Gene Simmons. But he made it. He made no a, feelings he, mutual. He made a solid. Yeah, he made a solid point uh, that that there were that there were that in the first thirty that in the pre-internet. Era of uh, of the rock and roll era, there there might have been he, he estimated there were about thirty iconic bands. He didn't unfortunately bands musical acts, and he didn't name them. In the last twenty years, in the twenty years since, he says there might have been five. Because you got you got to wonder, you know, it's not just music or the next or the next Beatles, the next James Joyce, or the next Monet being lost in all the free noise. Uh, from that delivery system that uh, the market values more than the uh, stuff it delivers. I agree. I was waiting for a, a Joseph Heller Catch-22 analogy there. Can you make one on the spot? You mean, uh, you, you, mean uh, you, you, can, you can be famous if you're already famous, but <laughs> if you're not already famous, you don't get to be famous? Yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> it. I think, I think that's it in a nutshell. But it's true, there's, there is, there's so much noise out there, and, you know, I guess, <laughs> I would lie if I said I wasn't cynical, but there's so much information out there that I feel like, and I wish I had this quote written down, I think, was it a, it was by an artist, it was, it was an Oscar, a writer, Oscar Wilde, Someone, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But just basically, there's so much information that the message is just getting lost. I don't know if uh, the Dober guy on Adams, I think similar to something that 
don't work God, but there's so much information coming at us. We're, we're trying don't to... Don't work the cartoon? Don't work the cartoon. Okay. He's not. Um, so it's, it's really... <laughs> <laughs> we're really good at making obscure references, vague and obscure references. It's it's a it's an occupation it's an occupational advantage. The so the, the uh, yeah I guess the argument that I hear over and over again is you know no one ever died from exposure. Now the way that I twisted the joke was well you know if you can't pay your rent or for where you live you're going to be exposed and you are going to die. Do you have a better punchline to that? I would. I, I think, and I think uh, Kreider. I think Kreider used this in his piece when he when he, when he said you can't pay you can't pay your rent with exposure. Did Kreider, yeah. did Kreider say that? He said something very similar to that. So the the um, and I one of the one of the jokes that I that I told was that. Um, after a uh, gentleman named Kevin Hancher, I think his name was, uh, uh, he was a sports columnist for the uh, for the uh, New Hampshire for the Times Leader in uh, Burlington, Vermont, and he said, and he was arrested for running a prostitution scheme out of on, online, and I said they should have given him the, they should have given him the Pulitzer Prize because he's the first newspaper man to figure out how to monetize the internet. I guess that joke was funnier when I thought it up. Huh? It's, a, it's okay. This is this is a tough crowd here today, so you know, don't take it personally. Um, so as you see behind you, there is a. Did you have something to say? The uh, the woman who blogs in her pajamas, and she's not eating Cheetos, from what I can see. And we don't really know if she's in the basement or not. But um, I read her blog, and that's cool. That's what, what she does, you know. And that's that's her hobby. That's fine. But basically, I guess, would we be lying if we said we didn't have a bias by saying that these people are putting us out of work? <laughs> And really, de just devaluing yes. well, <laughs> what we do. I, I, I know that I am in her piece, May Hill Fowler made a differentiation between the punditry and people who simply express right. their opinions. And Everyone's a critic. Journalism. <laughs> and I like I like to think of my call. I do a little bit of both, but well, yeah. I mean, if you're offering an opinion that also includes a lot of news, then you're Doing, you're doing well. Um, so, you know, the, the reality is is that not everyone is a good writer. Not always a good thing to hear. Third. <laughs> hey, I didn't come here to be a one. So, I have my takeaway from all of this is that um, that I wish that you would take away from this is that there is a dignity that pay confers upon your work. In my day job as a PR flack <laughs> for a human services agency, um, I one of the things that I do is I craft language. And I'm very, very proud to do this, but it's something that I couldn't do if I didn't have the skills and the, the experience and of course the willingness and you know believing in what I do and so one of the things that I did was I helped craft the elevator pitch slash tagline for our agency and just the first line is you know we believe every person has value and should have a place to call home so you know my conclusion is that I believe that work has value. Writing, art, photography, you know, fill in the blank there. And I believe that it should be paid. Should be paid for it. 
I, 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 I agree with that, and I think that the, I mean, my my take is that the the issue is one that we that we as a consumer culture have been have become so entitled to free content that I think people feel like suckers if they've got to pay for the content. And so um, one, one, stat, one statistic I read from the Saturday Evening Post was that for with newspapers, for every one dollar of print advertising newspapers lose, they're replacing with four cents of online advertising, which is not quite a sustainable business model. The, the thing is that that I, I that I, I think this is a consumer issue as well as an issue of to use, to use the term you use scabs people who work people working for free and putting other people putting keeping other people from getting paid the that it's almost going to take a a way for a, an almost cultural shift for people to become willing to pay for for content. Do you remember the outcry whenever the Post Gazette wanted to start charging people? You know, there, there's a great example where I will stand up and say, "That's you know, these these reporters have families. They need to feed their families. They need to pay their rent. They need to to live. They need health insurance. They need all of these things." And you've been getting all of this. I guess to go back to the sports team example, you've been getting the cow for free for so long and now they're asking this what modest sum of ten dollars a month for information and you know everyone becomes indignant and says well I'll go find my information elsewhere well that's great but then you know thank you for supporting the local economy it's important I mean maybe if more people would have paid for the Post Gazette they could have paid me for my blogging and, and what, what you do is important I mean the, the this this is our culture we're talking about here. The, these, you know, if you know if uh, if there had been music sharing in 1964, there might not have been the Beatles. If there had been, if hey, you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> if there, if you know if there had been uh, if if there had been blogging in 1870. Would there have been a Mark Twain? And the that's that's a life I don't even want to think about. No Mark Twain. Twain. That that would be devastating. That would. That's kind of sad. The uh, <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> and now we have people like Paris Hilton. That's hot. Next slide, baby. <laughs> All right, so just say no. This isn't like the 80s Nancy War, right? Nancy Reagan War on Drugs. This is the just, you know, say no. I think, you know, if you exercise that a little bit more. So, so yes, we're asking people when there was a, there was a call put out to me to speak, tell a story for a local publication, and I asked, well, how much does this pay? Well, we're giving you exposure. So, guess what I said? No. <laughs> does your wife do that a lot at home? Because she was <laughs> Actually, what I, what I was thinking was that, that, my, that my wife doesn't teach college classes for free either. <laughs> Um, the what I what I would what I would say is in addition to in addition to saying no, is that to, to keep to is to is to stay on your feet to keep going, not to not not give up. Thank you. Uh, to and you know if if you don't you know if you try to get paid and it doesn't work. Keep trying. Don't. Um, if if I'm if I'm fortunate enough next year to become an overnight sensation, it will have taken me about a part of twenty years to do it. So that that's that's my message: is that 
key is that you can't get paid. I don't know how, but... <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, we, don't have, we don't have all the answers. We're here to just kind of inspire you a little bit and tell you a little bit about why we think you should have got paid. So to wrap up, because we have just like three minutes, so where can people find you? Next slide, please. Where can people find you again, Eric Poole? Well, my, my book, Company of Heroes, uh, Forgotten Medal of Honor and the uh, Broadway Company's War in Vietnam, comes out on March 17th, and it'll be available everywhere books are sold, including Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all the other... Brick and mortar stores? All, all the brick and mortar stores, and all, <laughs> on, all the, on, the non-brick and mortar stores. Will it be the library for free? Yeah, I assume it will be. Okay. Hopefully. Great. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you to my special guest, Eric Poole, who came all the way from Albert City. Yeah, that was a long time to sit. Maybe we should have stood, huh?